A COVID-19 vaccine is here, but there have been roadblocks to getting it across the country, but especially here in the state of Pennsylvania. From winter storms to a mistake with the Moderna vaccine, hundreds of thousands of Pennsylvanians are still waiting for their shot. So what are we going to do to get this vaccination program back on track? Senator Ryan Allman is a senator from Pennsylvania from the Lancaster region and just joined the governor's COVID-19 vaccine task force. He joins us tonight to break down those questions and more. That's all coming up right here, right now. I'm Sam Chen and this is Face the Issues. Good evening and welcome to Face the Issues. I'm Sam Chen. The COVID-19 vaccine is here. Operation Warp Speed has been a success, delivering us two vaccines, a third on the way in less than a year. But there have been issues with its rollout all over the country, but especially here in our home state of Pennsylvania. Senator Ryan Allman is a senator from the Lancaster area of our state, and he has recently been appointed to the governor's uh, COVID-19 vaccine joint task force, and he joins us here tonight. Senator, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Sam, it's good to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. And before we even get into this, a lot to cover tonight, but before we get into this, it has been a crazy year health-wise for everyone across the state. For you as an elected official, certainly a bit crazier. How are you and your family doing? We're doing well. Thanks for asking, Sam. I, I have shared with, uh, with many folks, uh, my church family and uh, constituents who've asked, this has been by far the most challenging stretch of time that I've served in elected office over the last year. The, uh, this COVID pandemic, the response to COVID, going into the 2020 election, the aftermath of the election, and now this mass vaccination rollout. But I'm blessed. My wife and children are doing well. We have my mom who lives here with us, and uh, we're, we're doing well, but it has been a challenging time. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you and your family are doing well, and, and we thank you for your continued service. Getting into the issue, Senator, uh, obviously this week, uh, every, every week they, they rank the states. Uh, there's not a prize involved, but we are currently ranked 44th out of 50 for COVID, uh, the role of the vaccine. Um, this is getting worse. Two weeks ago, Pennsylvania was 39th. Uh, now, there's some things that are just not changeable. At the start of any vaccine rollout, there's gonna be more demand than supply. That's just a simple fact of the way these things roll out. Um, the weather, uh, we cannot predict the weather. I realize Punxsutawney Phil is a Pennsylvania resident, but we can't change the weather and how it impacts this. But there have also been issues, and to date, Pennsylvania has distributed less than 70% of the vaccines that we do have. What has been causing this logjam uh, with the rollout? The good news is I think we're turning the corner, uh, and I'll get into that in a minute, I'm sure. That, that number, the vaccination distribution rate, uh, first dose administration rate, is, is improving. Mm -hmm. uh, but there is no question that Pennsylvania uh, has not been doing well. And I'm pleased the governor has taken the step to pull together a legislative task force to finally involve the input, uh, to include the input of the General Assembly to bring more voices to the table, put together a, a strategic plan. Certainly, the supply is the foundational issue. Uh, the supply that's been allocated by the federal government uh, to the state, uh, that, is, uh, that supply is, is the demand far exceeds mm -hmm the uh, supply that's available, as you've talked about. But there are other issues that were here. To be direct about it, I think uh, former Secretary of Health, uh, Rachel Levine's uh, leadership of the Department of Health was a disaster. Uh, I've been very critical of Dr. Levine's uh, leadership throughout the COVID response, and that's no different here in terms of Pennsylvania's preparation to receive uh, the vaccine and the planning that was put in place um, for the vaccine rollout. I, I place a lot of that uh, responsibility uh, at, uh, at Secretary Levine's uh, feet, quite frankly. Uh, the communication, the communication from the Department of Health to the providers was sorely lacking. Uh, but again, I think uh, the COVID task force, the new acting secretary, Allison Beam, uh, I've been pleased thus far with the work that, uh, that she is doing. She inherited a mess at uh, the Department of Health. I think the communication is improving. And again, uh, 
from the very beginning of this COVID response, I've encouraged the governor to take this type of task force type of approach to bring more voices, to bring dissenting voices to the table, bring the private sector to the table, bring the General Assembly to the table um, and, and allow that, allow a, a group such as this to inform the process. Uh, I think we're already seeing the benefits of that with the COVID task force. That is good news. And, and I want to ask you a bit about that rollout and some of the governor's decisions. The governor, Tom Wolf, had added those 65 and older to the class 1A uh, categorization. And, and we can have a debate on the merits of that, certainly. Uh, but this was after the roll had begun, right? And so there's, you know, class 1A is being, being given, class 1B is getting ready, and now we add class 1A. And a lot of hospitals and health networks are saying, we don't even have enough vaccines to vaccinate everybody <laughs> right. 65 and older. And so you're seeing them going, well, hold on, hit the brakes, 75 and older first and let's work our way down. Uh, why this shift now, and regardless of whether it's the right decision, is this contributing to the rollout issues, or were there other significant issues in place that this is just kind of exasperated, but maybe is not the cause? I, I would say it's certainly exasperated. Uh, it added to the challenges with uh, supply and demand in that mix, and certainly the expectations that the broader public had in terms of how quickly we were be able we're going to be able to get vaccine to those uh, who were most vulnerable and, and who needed it. I don't believe that that was the plan, mm -hmm. that there was a strategic plan in place, quite frankly, at that time. Uh, I don't believe that that was effectively communicated. What the task force has done since we, we began our work two and a half weeks ago uh, was to put in place an interim plan to get to get through the challenges in, in the near term, but then to develop a strategic plan to put in place a, a transparent allocation model in terms of how the, the vaccine is distributed from the state to the counties, to the regions all across the Commonwealth, to, to establish clear benchmarks to measure, to, to, uh, to define success and metrics to, uh, to demonstrate success, to measure achievement, uh, and to put in place a communications plan. Just today, we discussed uh, the importance of having a uh, a customer convenient, a consumer convenient, a resident convenient, centralized place where folks can go mm -hmm. um, to establish eligibility and then to be able to schedule appointments. Uh, that's been a real challenge for folks. You've got folks who, sure. some are tech savvy, some are not, who are trying to navigate this system and are having difficulty getting through and identifying a place where they can receive a vaccination. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working quite aggressively to correct that so that any Pennsylvanian who's eligible, who wishes to receive a vaccination, is able to do so as supply catches up. And the good news is, it appears as though over the next few weeks, it will. Yeah, absolutely. And we had Dr. Brian Nestor, uh, CEO of Lehigh Valley Health Network on the show just a few weeks ago, said the same thing, that you know, the early stages, we can expect the supply to, to lag behind demand. But as we reach into the spring months, we're gonna see that catch up and, and it's promising to hear that you think the rollout is going to get much better to meet that supply coming in. Now, Senator, of course, the, the elephant in the room, the, the big story that broke just this last month was the Moderna vaccine and 100,000 doses of the Moderna vaccine that they're supposed to be second doses ended up being given as first doses. And uh, before we get to the question here, just to put our viewers' e minds at ease a little bit, uh, medically speaking, the first and the second doses are the same. So this is not something where there's a medical problem that we have. Um, the second dose is, is ideally given 28 days after the first dose, but can be given up to 42 days later. So it's not like we're out of a time window. Um, and uh, some people have asked, why can't we just mix the vaccines? And that has not been advised by the CDC. It's been done in Great Britain for extenuating circumstances, but not been advised by the CDC. Uh, but the larger question here is, how did this happen? And you know, Acting Secretary Bean, who again, inherited this, she literally stepped in as this was going on, has said, this is just a perfect storm, massive communication breakdown. Is that it? Or is there something else going on here that led to this? And more importantly, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? I think at the heart of it is not having a strategic plan in place mm -hmm. at the Department of Health. And again, as, as we've talked about, Secretary Beam absolutely inherited a mess. Um, I was shocked when I came aboard with the COVID task force, the COVID vaccination task force, um, where we were at in terms of, uh, of the planning process. 
Uh, again, we're turning the page, we're turning the corner on that, but I think not having a strategic plan in place, and it was, uh, as, as, I, as I see it, a massive uh, communications breakdown. Um, I think in, in, on the part of providers, or, but especially on the part of uh, the Department of Health. So uh, as the COVID task force has, has begun its work, the vaccination task force has begun its work, uh, we're committed to turning the page. There'll be time to look back. We're going to need to look back. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I've, I've shared with folks I'm not terribly interested at this point in pointing fingers. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just need to, to, to put a plan in place to make the corrections, to get it right. But there's certainly going to be a time where we're going to have to look back and conduct oversight of, of what occurred here, uh, not just with the vaccination distribution, but the entire COVID, COVID response or a number of issues I think we need to look at. Uh, but a communications breakdown, not having a strategic plan in place. Uh, and so we have taken the steps to correct that in the, in the interim. Folks can rest assured, in my view, that Pennsylvania is committed, that if you have received the first dose, if you receive the first dose of the vaccination, you will receive the second. And you will be able to receive that second dose at the same provider which you received the first within the CDC recommended window. That is good news. And Senator, I appreciate your approach. Let's get through the crisis first before we come back and review and hold people accountable. Let's just make sure we clean this up moving forward. Uh, we're gonna cut the break, but when we come back, I wanna talk about the, your work on this task force and ideas and proposals that you and your colleagues have for doing exactly that and moving forward. So don't go away, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. Again, my guest tonight, Senator Ryan Ament from the Lancaster region. Senator, thank you again for taking the time. The COVID uh, vaccine task force that you and three of your colleagues in the General Assembly serve on, uh, I want to get in a moment here to different proposals that, and, and avenues that you think could move our state forward. But let's start. The governor launched this task force. You have been calling on the governor to seek the input of the General Assembly uh, on quite a few issues regarding COVID. We, we're seeing this right now with the constitutional amendment about the governor's uh, emergency powers. What finally led to the formation of this task force? I think it was a recognition of, uh, of the significant challenge we were facing with respect to the vaccination distribution process and the importance of giving the broader public confidence that Pennsylvania did, in fact, have a plan. You're right. I have been um, calling on the governor since nearly the very beginning of Pennsylvania's COVID response last spring to form this type of bipartisan task force to provide feedback, uh, to, to be utilized as a decision-making body to ensure that we have dissenting voices at the table. You know, looking back to my time in the military, um, I, I genuinely believe that in a time of crisis, it's, more to, it's important to open up more channels of communication. It's important to open up uh, to ensure that you have more voices at the table, that you have dissenting views at the table. It's still the guy in the room or the lady in the room that's got to make the decision, the person in command that's got to make the decision at the end of the day. The governor's got to make the decision at the end of the day. Uh, but, you know, I certainly have found in my time elected office, uh, from local government, local borough council, to county clerk of courts, to state house, to the state senate, uh, the higher office uh, you, you serve in, it is, in fact, true, the further you are removed from the people. And so uh, it's important that you put, you open up channels of communication so that you're hearing from folks who are on the front line of this. And so I, I think the go-it-alone approach that the governor and Secretary Levine took uh, was, was highly problematic. That has led directly to this constitutional amendment that you highlighted, which I'm hoping voters approve uh, this, this spring. I think we're demonstrating the fact here with the COVID vaccination task force that this model of governance works, Mm -hmm. that we can make decisions in real time. uh, And it's important to have collaboration. It's important to have dissenting voices and uh, the bipartisanship and a response in in a time of crisis is uh, is important. You know, the first thing Winston Churchill did when he became prime minister uh, as the Germans uh, were invading France was form a all-party government Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, bringing all parties to the table, a coalition government. Uh, There's something to be said for that model. Uh, And again, we are, uh, this task force has uh, two members of the state Senate, two members of the state house representatives, um, and you and and Senator Haywood, one from each party, as well as in with your colleagues in the house is a bipartisan uh, task force that pulls from both chambers, 
The obviously the first issue that you and your colleagues are tackling is this Moderna vaccine situation. And you said before we went to break that you're confident we're going to be able to get these shots out. What is the process going forward there? Is it like how do, when the shots come in the state, how does the state decide what area gets what shots or how do they get to the health care providers, the health boroughs and so forth? It's, it's a terrific question, and that's really at the heart of uh, what the task force is developing now with the strategic plan is putting in place a allocation model mm -hmm. that uh, that encourages, that incentivizes throughput, uh, putting in place real metrics to ensure that that first dose of Moderna and Pfizer is is uh, is distributed. Eighty percent of, of all of those that are received are distributed within seven days. Mm -hmm. And then that we stick precisely to the operation uh, warp speed timeline schedule for that second dose. This is essential even as we as we increase supply. But I, I've been really pleased thus far with uh, the task force. I, I uh, was surprised when I got the call uh, asking me to serve. I wasn't sure what to expect. I wasn't sure if this would just be about a press release, if this would be about the optics. Uh, but the governor and the secretary of health have used this task force uh, as as a platform to receive feedback, um, as a decision making, as an actual decision making body, as mm -hmm. is, was the case with resolving the Moderna uh, distribution situation that uh, that developed a few weeks ago, we were able to respond to uh, to that in real time. It's a small group, and it's just the four legislative members, as well as the governor, the secretary of health, and the the director of Pima, uh, and we uh, we put in place um, just a couple of key steps to ensure that we were getting providers, we were communicating effectively with providers, getting providers on that necessary timeline to get, again, 80% of the first dose in the arm, um, seven uh, within seven days, mm -hmm. to ensure that we're, we are aligned with the operation warp speed timeline, that we were giving providers the ability to, to flex, as you talked about earlier, between the 28 to 42 days of effectiveness. Uh, that provided... Uh, that, that's going to provide uh, some assistance as we get back on track uh, over the next couple of weeks as supply, uh, as, as supply increases. So um, I think improving the communication, giving providers the flexibility on that second dose, getting on the operation warp speed schedule is going to help us uh, move, move through this, uh, this near-term crisis that, that developed. Well, that's great. And, the, and certainly welcome news for those who are waiting for that, that second shot of that vaccine. Now, obviously, we, we move past the Moderna situation. You guys seem to be on, uh, you have a plan in place. The uh, moving forward, it wasn't like Pennsylvania was at the top of the list distribution wise before the Moderna situation happened. And we're potentially going to have a third vaccine added as Johnson Johnson looks for their emergency clearance approval. What's the strategy and plan going forward? with potentially mm -hmm. three vaccines now. Yes, that's certainly going to, is, is going to help. Um, having the Johnson Johnson, which is a one-shot mm -hmm. vaccine, we do anticipate having supply within the next number of weeks, we're, we're being told, with the increase in um, the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, that, that's going to help. I think it's incredibly important that we improve the effectiveness and the efficiency of our system. Uh, many counties, many regions are such as Lancaster, are developing mass vaccination sites. Um, that, I believe, has the potential to get vaccine out to all those who want it in a much more effective and efficient manner. I'm really excited about the Lancaster County plan. Uh, our county commissioners have worked cooperatively with all four health, four health systems uh, that are in the region, uh, have worked with the private sector. We've got a team from Rock Littet, um, who obviously have tremendous expertise around logistical uh, planning and logistical planning implementation with, around live events. They've been really instrumental in the, in the Lancaster County plan. So the, de the development of these mass vaccination sites, more sustainable, um, large scale clinics, but then being very strategic about going out to those folks who can't or shouldn't go to a mass vaccination um, clinic. An example of that is uh, we have many all across Pennsylvania, but certainly in Lancaster County, uh, many nursing homes that are co-located with independent living facilities, mm -hmm. CCRC. And we don't want those folks. It doesn't make sense for those folks in the independent living um, to, to come to a mass vaccination site. They, they're living at a safe, secure facility, a facility that already has the capability to distribute the vaccine, 
that has the parking that's available. So we want to make sure that we're driving vaccine out to locations such as that. So what we're doing in the near term is we're actually reducing the number of providers to be more in line with the supply that is available uh, so that we can drive throughput, drive efficiency, and then as the, su the supply increases to increase the number of providers and then eventually get to a system where uh, you know, this is eventually going to transition back to the system as it existed prior to, mm -hmm. prior to COVID, uh, where you are scheduling with your primary care physician or your pharmacist to receive vaccine. So reducing the number of providers, driving th throughput, uh, make sure we're rewarding performance, um, the mass vaccination sites, um, and developing an allocation model that is transparent based on a population, based on the population over 65, based on the COVID infection rate, and based on the COVID death rate. A very clear, transparent formula to distribute, to distribute vaccine to counties. Oh, that's fantastic. And Senator, what's the benchmark then? So you are putting these plans together. When you look back on this, what's the benchmark of success? Uh, where do we do you and your colleagues say, yes, we pulled this off. This was a successful operation. The, the, um, the clear measure of success is that percentage rate of, of first dosage, getting 80 percent of first doses in seven days. Um, the, the second dose, the, the percentage of Pennsylvanians in each phase that are vaccinated, we're certainly very interested in how we compare to states around the country. We should care that we rank in the, uh, in, in the, the lower, uh, lower portion um, of, of states, and we certainly want to drive that up over time. So we're, we're, uh, we're closely looking, uh, closing, taking a very close look at that. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, Senator, thank you again for your insights and your time. Uh, don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Issues. Senator Allman, again, thank you for your time and for serving on this task force, for everything that you and your colleagues are doing to try to get this back on track and make sure Pennsylvanians across the state get their vaccines. Uh, we really appreciate this, so thank you for doing that. Um, I do want to, uh, as you know, we, we like to spend this last segment kind of getting to know our guests a little bit outside of the world of politics. And Senator, you have a fantastic family. Um, I, you know, have, we've known each other for a little bit and I've had the privilege of seeing you post about your family on social media. I know they are your pride and joy. Um, yeah. Tell me, how has your family been through all of this? And, and what are some of the neat things that you've gotten to see as you guys have been staying at home and so forth? Yeah, they're a refuge. You know, I come, I, I share with folks all the time. I, I come home to my kids. I have a fourth grader. Uh, Jack is, is 10. My daughter, June, is in first grade. She's seven. They both attend Mount Calvary Christian School outside of E-Town. My wife, Kate, teaches there. Um, and I've shared with folks that, you know, when I come home at the end of the day uh, and I'm with my kids, I'm with my family, but particularly my kids, they know me only as one thing. They know me as dad. And uh, they've been uh, just, just a real joy. They're doing great. They're having a great school year. We are so blessed. They've been in school in person all year. The folks there at Mount Calvary have done a phenomenal job. My wife, Kate's teaching there. She's teaching uh, virtual as well as uh, in, in person. And we're blessed. We lost my dad a couple of years ago. We're blessed that my mom now lives here uh, with us. And she's been a tremendous help to our family as we've been home and, and uh, been just the activity level around the COVID response, my job, my wife's work teaching. Uh, mom's just been a real blessing, been a real help to us. But uh, we're, we're, we're doing well. You almost had a special guest appearance, my kids, by the way. They just got home from school a couple of minutes ago. So you, you may, if you see one or two run by, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it certainly makes things more lively. That's for sure. No. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Sander, I understand your son Jack is a committed Tom Brady fan. Is this? It's shameful. It's <laughs> shameful, Sam. I know. You know, I uh, I'm an Eagles fan. I grew up all Philadelphia sports fan. And uh, a couple of years ago, you know, when the Eagles were making their march hmm. to the Super Bowl and got into the Super Bowl, my son uh, declared himself a Tom Brady and a Patriots fan. <laughs> uh, it was just I thought. I, poor, I don't know what else to say, but poor parenting, uh, clearly. <laughs> my wife's a Steelers fan. She's all Pittsburgh sports fan. I'm a Philadelphia sports fan. And my son, Jack, loved the Patriots and now has followed Tom Brady to, uh, to, the, uh, to, to Tampa Bay. Uh, you know, you can't argue the guy's a winner. Yeah, well, this, and this last year must have been fantastic for Jack then, uh, watching Brady bring home another one. 
Oh, he's been living it up. Uh, he's been, uh, you know, he's been obnoxious about it. You know, I'm an Army veteran, mm-hmm. and the Army Navy game. Jack, of course, roots for for Navy, so it kind of gives you a sense of Jack's personality. So pray, pray for me. <laughs> well, do now. Is there a chance that you can recruit your daughter and uh, you know even the odds a little bit? You know, I have tried, Sam, but but June adores her brother. Mm. Uh, they have a fantastic relationship. They're like any kids. I mean, they, they fight over things from time to time and, and argue and Jack picks at her and, and, you know, just like any boy, brother, older brother would. Uh, but I've tried to recruit June. My wife has tried to recruit June over to being a Steelers fan, but she is, she adores her brother and is loyal to her brother. So I am in a household in terms of football. We've got a Steelers fan. We've got a, uh, an Eagles fan and I've got, to Tampa Bay Buccaneers fans. <laughs> well, I mean, that if, if that relationship between them sounds like fantastic parenting to me, and so well done, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. They, they're, they're blessed and they're great kids, and uh, we're, we're fortunate to have this opportunity to serve. Absolutely. Well, Senator Ahmed, again, thank you for your time. And more importantly, thank you for all that you do. And to you and your family, please uh, continue to be safe. Thank you, Sam. Appreciate it. Good talking to you. Good to talk to you. That is our show for tonight. I want to thank Senator Ryan Allman from Lancaster again for joining us. And of course, thanks to you for tuning in. I hope you'll join us again right here next week. My name is Sam Chen. On behalf of all of us at Face the Issues, thank you and good night.